Governor Holcomb's briefing will begin in two minutes. For the journalists joining us in the digital press room, if you would like to ask a question, you can click the raise your hand button. When you are called upon, we will unmute your microphone and then you also will have to unmute your microphone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, just a couple updates on my part before we go to Dr. Box and your daily updates and contact, contact tracing starts today. And then you've got a guest that's going to join us as well. But we've been, we've been at this for a little over, well, a couple months um, daily. And we want to make sure that we're um, providing the public with substantive updates on a regular basis. Going forward, we will um, host these uh, press conferences at 2.30, going forward, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Now, having said that, uh, if there is significant news that needs to be shared before Wednesday of this week, uh, we'll call an audible and we'll be here tomorrow at 2.30. Uh, same thing on Thursday. Same thing on Saturday or Sunday for that matter. But I, I did want everyone who's tuning in to know that we'll continue to, task force will continue meeting on a regular basis. We'll continue posting all of our updates on a daily basis so you can always, um, as Dr. Box, Dr. Weaver uh, refer to on a daily basis, you can always go to coronavirus.in.gov um, if you have um, questions, frequently asked questions or specific questions timely. Uh, about where we are on that day. We update those every single day. So coronavirus.in.gov, or if you have a question um, um, regarding employment or unemployment insurance benefits, um, normally you would see Fred Payne here on Tuesday and Thursday as well. He's still accessible um, every day, uh, but he also, you can get information from in.gov backslash DWD, Department of Workforce Development. So um, we're, we're, as we continue to get back to work across all of the state agencies, um, we will remain committed uh, to making sure that we continue to be transparent and up to date uh, through the various ways that we get our information out. So with that, I will turn it over to you for our daily on the ground update. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, Hoosiers. Today we reported 511 additional cases of COVID-19 in the state of Indiana, which brings to our total 24,627 the total number of Hoosiers who have been known to be diagnosed with COVID-19. This gives us a positivity rate of about 17% among the 146,688 Hoosiers who have been tested to date. We unfortunately also saw 30, 32 additional confirmed deaths. To date, 1,411 Hoosiers have died of COVID-19, and another 129 are believed to have died from this disease based on their clinical diagnosis.
I want to note that uh, we had almost 6,700 tests reported yesterday, which is fantastic to see. As you can see, we've also had the percentage of our occupied ICU beds and available ventilators holding steady uh, throughout these past weeks and today. As I've said before, increased testing means increased contact tracing so that we can identify people who might have been exposed and ensure that they are taking precautions to avoid possibly infecting someone else. Contact tracing is a core component of any disease investigation. We've been doing this for well over 100 years here in the state of Indiana, for TB, for measles, mumps, and now for HIV, and for outbreaks with foodborne illnesses. The real difference here is that this is just a much broader scale with a different disease process with COVID-19. It's something we're legally authorized to do, but more importantly, we're ethically mandated to do this to protect Hoosiers all across our state. We have a responsibility to protect Hoosiers from this disease. Contact tracing allows the state to respond swiftly to outbreaks and contain the threat of additional illnesses across our state. More importantly, it's how we help you protect your loved ones, the ones that you work with, your neighbors, and other individuals that I know you don't want to also become ill with this disease. Contact tracing involves asking a series of questions of people who test positive. For instance, when did their symptoms start? Or who they might have been in contact with? Did they go to work or school, to a grocery store? Did they eat out? Did they have a family gathering? We get a list of people they might have had close contact with, then we contact those people to see if they have symptoms and to provide information that they need to keep themselves and others safe since they might have been exposed. At all times, we protect individuals' privacy. We don't provide the name of the positive patient. We don't share personal information with others. All information is held securely at the state level. Traditionally, contact tracing has been handled by local health departments, but this pandemic requires a massive response. So today marks the first day of a centralized approach here at the state level. We have onboarded already 325 people to work as contact tracers through our partnership with Maximus. A total of 500 will be onboarded by the end of the month. These are all Hoosiers or individuals who attend school here in Indiana. We've had more than 4,700 people reach out to express interest in becoming a contact tracer. This includes students, the general public, and 500 individuals who responded to the Healthcare Reserve Workforce Survey and volunteered to help with this as a response. We will scale up as needed as we continue to move through this response. A total of 285 cases have already been loaded into the Microsoft Dynamics system and outbound calls have already begun, as have emails and texts. I also want to put another plug in for the state-sponsored testing sites around the state. You can find all of these at the COVID-19 testing link on our dashboard at www.coronavirus.in.gov. This list includes our drive-through clinics, our statewide sites, and those offered by healthcare systems, local health departments, and other entities. The criteria for testing is listed on each testing site on the map. If you're coming to a state testing site, I want to emphasize that there is no cost for these tests, and we want you to be tested if you have symptoms, if you live with someone who has symptoms, if you've been exposed to a positive case and need a test, for instance, to go back to work, if you're a high-risk individual, someone over the age of 65, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, a pregnant woman, a member of a minority population at greater risk because of the severe illness, or live with a high-risk individual, you don't need to be symptomatic if you fall into these categories. So please take advantage of this opportunity. All of these sites are listed on the testing map at www.coronavirus.in.gov. You can search by county and find the locations nearest to you. You can also find information on how to register for testing at one of our large-scale sites here. Finally, I want to remind Hoosiers not to ignore health issues that might, be, that might not be related to COVID-19. We need you to schedule your routine screenings, like your pap smear or your mammogram, Studies have shown that even delaying your mammogram an additional six months over that year's period of time can affect your, affect your survival rate. 
We want you to get your colonoscopy, get your blood pressure rechecked, and get your lab work done. If you have a lesion on your skin or a mole that's changed, please reach out to the dermatologist and go get that looked at by the dermatologist or a family doctor or your internal medicine doctor. Healthcare providers have plans to keep patients safe. They have you call in when you get there. They are requiring patients to wear masks. They are limiting the number of people in the waiting room. And they're spacing out visits and cleaning thoroughly between every visit. We do not want people to delay getting medical care and then wind up with a more serious illness or invasive problem down the road. Also, we cannot forget about our youngest Hoosiers. You know that on March 13th, our president declared a national emergency. And then on March 24th, the CDC posted guidelines emphasizing the importance of routine, well child care visits and immunization because they knew that this would be at risk, especially for our children under 24 months because many of their vaccines are received at that time. Unfortunately, there has been a significant decline across the United States and in Indiana in routine vaccine ordering and doses administered for things like measles and whooping cough. We believe that parental concerns about potentially ex exposing their children to COVID-19 are contributing to this decline. As Hoosiers start to return gradually to work and even some social activities, children who are not protected for these vaccine-preventable diseases are going to be more vulnerable to get very sick and potentially even die from things that we can prevent. So with us today, we have Dr. Tony Giaquinta. He is the president of the Indiana uh, branch of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And he's here to remind parents about the vital need to protect your children against serious vaccine preventable diseases and other important aspects of the well child checkup. Welcome, Tony. Thanks so much for joining us. It's an honor, Dr. Box. It's a pleasure to be here. We're so glad to have you. You know, I know I read the MMWR report that came out from the CDC. They were concerned about this and started talking about it very early, and then their report came out showing the data associated with this. Is that what we've seen also here in Indiana? Can you talk a little bit about what, what you have seen in your pediatric offices, in our family doctor's offices? Absolutely. When uh, the president declared the state of emergency, um, the practices were really quick to reevaluate um, uh, to make sure that pediatrician's office could uh, safely encounter well visits. And um, what we've had to do is think innovatively to make sure that when children come into our clinics that we can protect ourselves as well as protect our children. And unfortunately, during that gap of time, um, we understood that parents are worried. And um, because of that, we have seen a large drop off in the state in our immunization rates, um, somewhere in the 30 to 40% range. And as we know that when we delay uh, vaccinations, we definitely increase the risk of emerging infectious diseases. You know, and talk to us a little bit about that, because I think some people think, oh, what's the big deal with chicken pox or, or measles or even whooping cough? So talk to us a little bit about your fears as we get back to our new normal, what that could mean for children that are unvaccinated or have missed their vaccinations. Absolutely. Our state um, actually has a very high rate of what we call herd immunity, where we have done as a state a wonderful job of vaccinating our children. And what that means is that uh, for our population, we enjoy a high rate of immunization protection against dangerous uh, vaccine preventable diseases like measles and meningitis and whooping cough. And so as we, uh, as our, our younger children um, De, uh, decrease their immunizations, then that does introduce an opportunity for these uh, vaccine preventative diseases to reemerge. Um, and of course, this is for our children, our most vulnerable. And so when we uh, decrease our immunizations, that absolutely increases the chance of a measles outbreak, a whooping cough outbreak, or even dangerous uh, types of meningitis like haemophilus influenza or pneumococcus. Um, so again, uh, this is really highlighting the need to get back into your pediatrician's office. We are open for children and your pediatrician needs to see you in their office. 
So we've talked a lot about immunizations, but I know that a well child checkup, checkup has a lot of components that go far beyond just even the immunizations. Talk to the um, viewers just a little bit about what else goes on at those appointments that are really critical for families and for children. Yes, Dr. Box, when your child comes to our pediatric appointment, um, there is a lot of things that are gonna go on to make sure that your child is growing and thriving and developing appropriately. So some of the most important things that we do as pediatricians is we screen their de development, uh, we perform a comprehensive physical exam, and then also one of the most important things that we do is a mental health screening, especially for our teenagers and adolescents, to ensure that uh, some of the stresses that they're experiencing during this coronavirus pandemic, such as increased anxiety and depression, is being addressed and treated appropriately. And I know it's been kind of a joke around here, but anybody with teenagers is really suffering at home with their teenagers that are cut off from their socializing with their friends. So talk a little bit about what teenagers are experiencing at this time and, and how you can help them with that. Yeah, I mean, we know that our teenagers and adolescents rely on strong social bonds uh, for their own development and their mental health. And when those are taken away and some of their other um, there are other important social interactions like uh, athletics or with friends. Uh, when those are taken away, that does increase their anxiety and, uh, and, and does cause them to have an increased risk of depression. And uh, a lot of times they're also picking up and reacting to the stress that we adults have been having, whether it's uh, uh, insecurity with our jobs, our finances, and they are also reacting to our own mental health. And so all of these combined really can create a toxic, uh, a toxic environment for children. And we want you to know as your pediatrician that we are open for them and that we want to hear your concerns. For children, this can mean uh, increased uh, irritability, just increased moodiness, uh, or sometimes they will just feel more socially isolated and not wanting to interact. These can all be signs of a mental health that is suffering um, and that really uh, we want to help you address with your child. And lastly, Dr. Giaquinta, can you reassure those parents out there or, or grandparents like myself that may have anxieties about bringing their child to a healthcare setting. What kinds of things are you doing in your office or you see your colleagues doing to reassure the safety of that? Well, as president of the Indiana AAP, I represent over 900 pediatricians, subspecialists, and advanced practitioners. And we have collaborated uh, statewide to make sure that um, when you come into your pediatric appointment, we are taking many innovative steps to make sure that that uh, visit is a safe one. And we've done a lot of different, um, different changes in our procedures, such as making sure only well visits are seen during the morning and sick visits in the afternoon, or making sure that when you come into your visit, uh, your staff member will have a mask on and uh, many times will direct you straight to their room and bypass the waiting room altogether. We have also taken steps to increase our access and our hours so that our pediatricians aren't all working at the same time, but that we can spread out our patients throughout the day so that our waiting rooms and offices won't be as congested. Um, and then finally has been the innovation in telemedicine. Uh, our pediatricians have been able to uh, screen visits, and if we can adequately address them over the phone, we certainly will. And a, a big shout out to FSSA and Dr. Ann Zare. Uh, we've been able to work closely with their office to, maintain, uh, to ensure that our offices are well supported uh, with telemedicine so that we can use those uh, various different types of encounters uh, to take care of your children. But most importantly, most importantly is that we want to make sure that you're, you understand that your child, your, your pediatrician is there for your child and we are open and access, accessible to them um, for any of your needs. So uh, we understand that you are worried, but we want to reassure you uh, that your pediatrician um, is here for you and we want to get you into our office so that we can meet your, you and your child's health needs. Thank you so much, Dr. Giaquinta. And I think you told me you'd be able to stay through the question and answer time in case there's any specific questions, right? I'd be happy to. Thanks again. Well, thank you, Dr. Box, and thank you, uh, Dr. Giaquinta. And, and you both used the word a couple of times, reassurance. And uh, I'll just reiterate or repeat uh, myself that that's the reason 
why we uh, conduct these press conferences on a weekly, daily basis, and why we'll continue to do that Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We, we feel comfortable about taking that next step um, in light of we put our back on track roadmap out that has these milestones or has these dates that lead through July 4th to give um, the public at large uh, that reassurance that if we remain on this course, this is where we will be as the uh, days and weeks and in fact months unfold ahead. But having said all that, I've talked about detours along the way and, and uh, we'll be guided by that information as it comes to us on a daily basis and we'll update folks on a daily basis. Um, and if we need to ramp up again, these press conferences, we will do just that. We'll be getting a lot of information in in, in uh, every other day increments, obviously on daily increments, but also every other day, as you mentioned, um, daily tracing, um, those uh, programs, testing and tracing that are really go hand in glove uh, together, that will provide us an opportunity to give very substantive updates on a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Friday as we look off into the, uh, into the future. So with that, Rachel, I know we've got a lot of questions in the queue. Let's get at it. Stephanie Zeppelin, WISH TV. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Hello, can you hear me? We can, crystal clear. Okay. I had a race to unmute myself. <laughs> um, so I have two questions. Um, first one for, uh, for Dr. Box. When we announced the stages of opening, you said it would be contingent on the number of new cases that would develop. Uh, based on last week's numbers, as Indiana begins phase two, uh, what's your reaction? And do you think we are going to continue reopening or did the numbers jump higher than you might have guessed? And question two for, for Governor Holcomb. Um, today, the Supreme Court announced Attorney General Curtis Hill will have his law license suspended for 30 days and then automatically reinstated. Do you think this is an appropriate punishment as in the past you've called for him to resign? And should he come back to his post after his suspension? And should he be able to run for office again? So I'll start, uh, Stephanie. Part of the reason we didn't use specifically the numbers jumping um, is because we knew we were going to continue to ramp up our testing and increase our testing. And as you do that, you will find more positive numbers, especially as we're testing industry like our, our meat packing plants and our canning plants, and especially as we continue and to advance and increase our testing in long-term care facilities, our jails and our prisons. That accounts for a lot of the numbers across our state. So we expected that to go up. That's why we've used several other metrics that we look forward to, such as hospital admissions, EMS runs, emergency room visits, all of which we have um, on a really real-time basis, 24-hour basis. Yeah, and Stephanie, let me answer questions two, three, four, and five um, in, in the order I think that you um, asked. Number one, this is just um, my reaction. This is not, I will, say, I will underline this, this is not my uh, legal counsel's analysis. This decision um, just came down earlier uh, this morning, right before noon. Um, as far as does the, I think you worded it, does the punishment fit the crime? Um, we'll see. Um, obviously, um, this decision bolsters the case of the victims um, going forward on the route that they're on. Um, we find ourselves in this unprecedented time that our states, Indiana's top law enforcement official, has been suspended um, for um, ethical wrongdoing. Um, now having been validated for the fourth time, including, as you mentioned, by our state's highest court, there's no good news in all of this for anyone. and everyone that's involved in this specific um, case, but suffice it to say, my position, my personal position, um, has not changed since I reviewed the facts myself going on about two years ago. Um, and so with this current decision that, again, just came down right before noon, um, it has led to a number of other questions um, that I am seeking not just uh, guidance to, but answers to. And, and you refer to a number of them. So we won't allow grass to grow underneath us as we get those answers. And after my discussions with my legal team, uh, we'll be sharing those on a more public basis. Steve with KPC Media. 
Good afternoon, Steve. Steve, you should be able to speak. We'll come back to Steve. Lindsay or Doty, the Indianapolis Business Journal. Afternoon, Lindsay. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, real quick follow up on the Curtis Hill uh, ruling. So would you consider appointing a replacement or is that something you're still deciding as you talk to legal counsel? And then um, also wanted to ask about uh, several utility companies petitioned the IURC to allow them to collect uh, lost revenues due to the pandemic from consumers. And I'm curious what your position is on that. Yeah, I'll make um, any and all decisions that I have the authority to do so. Um, and that is, Lindsay, as you, as you ask, rightly, um, something that is in question. And again, we'll be, we'll be seeking um, a quick um, turnaround on those. I am seeking a quick turnaround on those questions to be answered. Uh, in terms of the utilities, that's why we have the IURC um, in place. They review these matters. Obviously, in terms of evictions or bills, those have been um, postponed, but obligations have not. Uh, and so that will go before the IURC. Rob Burgess, the Wabash Plain Dealer. Afternoon, Rob. Afternoon, Governor. Uh, good to be with you again. Sorry it won't be quite as often, but I'll take whatever I can get. <laughs> we'll be here on Tuesday and Thursday. Play and that, that's a good reminder, Rob, actually, is um, just because we don't all huddle up together statewide, we're all still here every day. And well, uh, so yeah. please feel free to uh, directly ping us. For sure. I appreciate that. Definitely. Um, Dr. Box, I did want to return to the presumptive positive cases. Uh, those have kind of steadily written, uh, risen over the last couple weeks since you first started announcing those. And I've encountered some skepticism from readers when I include those numbers in my stories. Um, will there be any additional information on these like county level breakdowns of these cases, uh, which are being shown as one big number statewide right now? No, I, I think we're a little over 100 on those right now. I'm below 120 or a little over 100. And we won't do any further breakdown on that. I, I will say to you that uh, the test is not perfect. It is, if it's positive, it is, it is COVID-19. It's SARS-CoV-2 because we're, we're actually doing the PCR for that. But if it's negative, it does not always mean that the patient does not have COVID-19. In fact, we, we found that to be true in cases. I actually had a good friend that reached out and said, been sick for two weeks. My test was negative a week ago. My toes are blue and I can't smell or taste anything. I'm like, you've got COVID-19, go to the emergency room because she was having shortness of breath. So I think that we have to look at the entire clinical picture and that's why it's so important that we let our healthcare professionals help us to understand why an individual died and make that, if, if they make that a part of the death certificate, we include it. Tom Davies, the Associated Press. Afternoon, Tom. Hello, Governor. Uh, now that we're a week into the uh, lifting of restrictions, uh, how many uh, are you still getting complaints about non-essential businesses operating improperly, uh, reference to uh, the case uh, in Benton County with the drag strip uh, or the racetrack there? And then also, uh, how do you believe the opening of businesses have, has gone so far? Well, I mean, it's a good question. I'm glad you raised it. Joe, feel free to step up. But, uh, you know, this is going to be a daily reminder as we gradually, methodically um, bring more activity back online, whether it's, as, as Dr. Giaquina mentioned, it, if it's people that are seeking social activity or businesses reopening their doors, maybe at 50% capacity, or state parks, or every beautiful day that we have, um, I, I see things um, through two different lenses. One is I'm so happy that people are breathing in the fresh air and getting exercise. Two, I don't want folks to abuse this um, opportunity. And so that social, physical distancing, um, hygiene, stepping up your hygiene is so critically important. I'm gonna ask you to comment on this too because, because we're in the early stages of this. We're going to have to manage our way through this virus for the foreseeable future. As we test more and we learn of more positive cases and we get care to the folks that need care, but this is not gonna be July 4th, it's over, we're there, we're done. This will be with us 
for the foreseeable future. And so how we conduct ourselves, our habits, our routines, critically important. And uh, I can just tell you, it's been somewhat of a mixed bag. Sometimes I get reports that it's like Christmas out here, everybody's getting out, and then I get the reports of, well, this business is not ready to open their doors yet because they can't do it safely. Thank you for making that decision. Not to not reopen, but to do it safely on a safe timeline. And so I have been very heartened, quite frankly, that uh, for the most part, what we are seeing, 99, I always say 99.99% um, are concerned about doing the right thing for themselves and for others. And that is uh, encouraging to see. Uh, Joe, you might just refer to those individual cases because you're seeing um, yes. that concern expressed in a different, in a different yes. way. Joe Aaron's general counsel here in the governor's office. I'll answer the question with a, in a couple of ways. First, we didn't talk about this last Thursday, but in terms of the number of complaints that have been investigated going back the five weeks since the start of the uh, stay at home and moving through the, the various uh, stages of that, there have been 1,458 complaints. The number of complaints that were unfounded, 1,266, and there have been 138 verbal warnings. And it's been heart, you know, really heartening that, that uh, even in the verbal warnings, in 138 of them, uh, they ended up, uh, those business owners ended up complying at that point. And that's important because we have to have compliance with the executive order. Hoosiers are good people. There's thousands of business owners that are across the state that are complying with the executive order, and that's really wonderful. Uh, with respect to Benton County, we did have a business up there that was given a verbal warning and there was not compliance at that point. And so there was a conversation with them because again, we're trying to work with businesses to get to compliance, not, not go right into enforcement. That's not what we've tried to do from the start. And so there was a conversation. Unfortunately, after that conversation, there continued to be non-compliance. And so we issued our very first cease and desist order. So out of the 1,458 complaints that have been investigated, only one has resulted in a cease and desist letter, and ultimately the business came into compliance over the weekend, and that's that's appreciated. But that's uh, that's kind of where we stand with our enforcement effort. And the great news, as the governor alluded to, is that businesses are complying. They are complying with the executive order, and that's important as we move through the next few stages of this uh, roadmap that we've laid out last Monday. And there's a lot of local and state cooperation and partnership on this front, wanting to do the right thing. You want to talk about just kind of where we are right now? So Indiana has done such a good job of social distancing, of staying at home, and, and that is why we, we are where we are right now. As we gradually start to open things up, we know that people are going to be at increased risk of getting infection. And we know that we still don't have a vaccine. We know that we still don't have medicines that are easily accessible or definitely proven to treat this disease. So we know how critical it is to continue to protect our most vulnerable population. But I'd say also, I wanna share something that General Lyle shared with me earlier. And that is that, you know, we've been working in very close um, contact here at the state level with a lot of our people across a lot of agencies and he's had a lot of individuals from the guard that have been spun up to help, help us out and they had one individual test positive and of course that's a concern because we've been doing our best to wear masks and to social distance and do all the proper hand hygiene but you still wonder if someone couldn't have gotten infected but not a single other person out of that entire group that this individual was working with within the guard came back positive when we tested so I think it really speaks, and, and General Lyles even said that, that six foot thing really works. So I really encourage you to, to take this to heart and to do that. Again, if you're outside and it's your spouse that you sleep beside every night, I don't expect you. They have to be, you know, six foot apart from he or she. But realistically, we should do that with people that we're not in close contact with every day of our life, even outside. Yeah. And just a reminder that these, all of these efforts to maybe say slow, no, and follow. Um, slow meaning these the social distancing or physical distancing, the slowing it down by washing your hands or um, making sure that we have the proper PPE inventory, all those things in our response effort to slow. And then to know that's where the testing comes in. That's where we're able to um, allocate resources and, and 
kind of meet the surge with our own surge response and then to follow and that's the tracing. So it's the slow, the no and the follow, three critically important ingredients to this recipe to, to defend against the spread and to keep it flattened, the curve flattened. That's where we are today. Um, but as Dr. Box reminds me on a more than daily basis, um, we have to be vigilant about all of our efforts. Rachel. We'll return to Steve with KPC Media. Yes, yeah, Steve, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me this time? We can. Thank you. Sorry, my, my laptop's exhausted from daily uh, press conferences as well. So. <laughs> we'll give uh, it a breather. Do Dr. Box, according to the most recent uh, reports on the ISDH uh, site, Indiana's had uh, 129 flu deaths over 30 weeks, while we've reported more than 1,400 COVID-19 deaths over eight weeks. Uh, we keep dealing with posts on social media and just these unfounded theories that uh, places have stopped counting flu or pneumonia or, or other causes of death and that everything's just simply being counted as as COVID-19 uh, at this point. So can you just review for us what boxes need to be checked for the state to actually count something as a COVID-19 death? Also, just verify again uh, my assumption that presumptives are not included in that in that total. And are there any indications that uh, these deaths are being wrongly classified or inflated in some way? No, I, I do not believe that we're over inflating that number for sure. Um, I wish in a way that we were because it's a lot, a lot of individuals that have lost their lives and unfortunately more will occur, I'm sure, before we get the vaccine in place for this. But realistically, when we look at this, if an individual um, passes away and they have a positive COVID-19 test, and that was felt to be the reason for this death, then, then we, will, we will call that a COVID-19 death. If the individual um, was on their death certificate, the healthcare professional said that COVID-19 was a, con a contributor to their death, you know, whether that was that their heart stopped or, or that they had overwhelming uh, pneumonia, sepsis, whatever that is, and they put down that COVID-19 was a contributing factor to that, then that will be a COVID-19 death. But you can look at our website and see that we separate those every day if they did not have a positive COVID test at the same time. And a separate but related question, Dr. Kaufman, would you like to just talk about the runs that you're seeing and tracking on your radar? so that we're not just looking at one thing, that yeah, we're sure. looking at everything. Yes, thank you, Governor. I'm Mike Kaufman, State EMS Medical Director with the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. We are tracking a multitude of different data points. Um, it really starts from the time that someone were to access the emergency medical services system. So the time that a 911 call is placed, we're looking at the different complaints that someone might be complaining of to the public safety answering point. And then once the EMS crew arrives, we're tracking symptoms such as influenza or COVID-like symptoms that a person might complain of. And then after an assessment's been completed by the paramedic or EMT, we're also looking at reported symptoms such as cough, shortness of breath, and even fever. We're looking at these trends both locally as well as across the state. We're looking at those by district, and we're able to track those numbers and use that data to help Dr. Box and her team look at overall incidence and prevalence of, of where we're seeing um, COVID illnesses pop up across the state. That's been very helpful, especially as, we have, as we've looked across the state to uh, where to allocate resources, where to allocate testing, and as we look to see how we're doing with the, um, with the reopening plan and where we're at and where areas are, are progressing nicely according to the governor's plan. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Brandon Smith, Indiana Public Broadcasting. Good afternoon, Brandon. Afternoon, Governor. I'm gonna have uh, two or three questions here since we're gonna be doing these a lot less. Um, first to Dr. Box, on contact tracing, you said that the information is kept private. Uh, help me clarify that first. If I get called by the contact tracing call center and they say, well, you've been in contact with someone who tested positive, am I gonna know who that person is? Yep. And then secondly, okay, so, and then secondly, um, what if someone refuses to cooperate with the contact tracing? And then my question for Governor Holcomb is, we've known for at least six months, if not more, about the possibility of Curtis Hill's law license being suspended. How were you and your team not prepared to know what can or cannot be done with a 30-day suspension? Yeah, because that, that question was not before the court. 
Um, and what I would say is that, no, we do not call an individual and say, hey, you were exposed to Mike Smith on Saturday at the wedding, and we think you could have, you know, COVID-19, or you could show up with COVID-19. We do not release names with regards to anyone. Now, do sometimes people figure that out? Probably that happens. Or do sometimes people reach out themselves because they're concerned and they know the people that they've been around and they, they want to protect the people that they care about and their neighbors, their coworkers, their family. So that does happen sometimes, but that is not going to come from the State Department of Health. Um, so I cannot force someone to tell me who they've been in contact with or where they've been. Fortunately, we've not really run into that problem because Hoosiers all across our state want to protect the people that they care about, the people that they love. They don't want to infect someone else. And, and that has been a big concern. So we haven't really run into that issue, at least to my knowledge at this point. Yeah, and I would just, I wasn't trying to be flip, uh, uh, Brandon. Um, when I said this question was not before the court, it wasn't. You asked how I might not know. Um, the answer is I'm not omnipotent. I didn't know if they would speak to this question. Um, they did not, as far as I've reviewed so far, but this has only come out right before, before noon. I did not uh, contact the Supreme Court in any way. We did not in this office or interfere or ask for additional questions to, be, to come before them. Um, obviously, the, the, uh, in one chamber during the legislative session, uh, this, this issue was addressed, um, but it did not pass out. I said at the time that it would be um, helpful and it would clarify uh, this exact question, uh, but it wasn't addressed legislatively. I would have signed that bill into law. Um, and so then it went back to the court. Again, I did not interfere in any way. Um, but um, knowing now where we are, uh, I will get with my um, legal counsel and my team here internally and see um, what are the steps ahead, what do they look like. Governor, yes. Yep. So I, I think the other thing that I, I should mention is that Hoosiers all across our state want to be able to address this at an individual level and a contact tracing, people that are positive, the contacts that they've come into, so that we don't have to take a step back and have to address this again at a community level with some type of non-pharmaceutical intervention like having people stay home or closing things down further. So I think there's a desire for our state to get back to the new normal and to not be a contributor to our inability to do that. Cassie Garrett, Whitewater Publications. Good afternoon, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me and thanks for having the calls. Um, Dr. Box, as we've expanded testing and we're, we're learning um, more ways that we can test, can you kind of provide us with a breakdown of what we're currently using across the state? I know as we've added like drive-throughs, um, uh, we've heard a little bit about antibody testing, swabs, Abbott machines. Can you give us an idea of, of um, how those are, are working out and how um, accurate we feel like they are. And then with your testing, um, you mentioned that some people are getting tested twice. Is that going into our overall testing number or do we keep track that, you know, certain people have had to be tested multiple times until they shed that virus? Very good questions, and that is why we do cull through the data to make sure that we aren't counting people multiple times. There are some individuals that are, in order to release them back into, say, a long-term care facility or, or back to their home where there may be somebody there that is at particularly high risk that are doing some follow-up testing to determine if they're still positive for the a PCR, for the virus itself. So the, the PCR is the most widespread testing, which is the nasopharyngeal swab that we do in the nose area and then send that off. And again, it's very accurate. If it comes back positive, you have SARS-CoV-2 virus there on that, on that test. Um, can it be negative a certain percentage of the time? Yes, maybe even as much as 30% of the time we could see negative results. And that may be a little more common in asymptomatic individuals. Um, we are also doing the Abbott Now test, um, which again is, is looking specifically uh, for that virus. And that testing, we, we've got about 15 new machines that we have been using um, several of them in our Department of Corrections. And some of them we have also used in our um, federally qualified health clinics and other places. The limitation there has been getting the number of cassettes that we need, but um, we are now getting some regular distribution of those cassettes so we can test more individuals 
individuals uh, across the state with that, and that's really just been a supply chain issue. You may have seen that they also recently um, just approved um, an emergency use authorization for a saliva test that individuals can collect at home, which is if you've ever done like the 23andMe or some other test for genetics, uh, you just basically spit into a tube and send it back in and then we can test that. That is not very widespread, of course, at this point in time and there's only one test that I'm aware of that's approved for that uh, through Rutgers, out at Rutgers. Um, and then the other antibody testing, we're starting to see more tests. Um, I know the um, FDA pulled back some of the EUAs that they had so for some of the antibody tests because they just were not good tests, meaning that some of them were testing for the coronaviruses, many of them that caused just the common cold, which we probably are all gonna be positive for. Um, and there, the concern was that it may not be accurate um, and we may not be giving good information to people. As you may know on our study, we did do an antibody test um, and we're going to interpret that very cautiously and very carefully with individuals going forward and continuing to look as these EUAs are studied and we'll know whether these tests are actually good, good tests or not going forward. So just to put a bow around it, um, we've got the state is partnering with various entities on a daily basis. You just mentioned it your, in your report, 6,600 plus tests over the mm -hmm. last 24 hours um, with IU Health and Lilly and mm -hmm. all over the state of Indiana. Um, we've got the drive-throughs all over the state of Indiana that are mobile, move around. We tested a little over 8,000 individuals in our drive-throughs at this point in time. And we have the Optum sites. We have 20 sites up and running now across the state. The additional 30 will be added this week, I think starting on Wednesday. So there'll be 50 sites. Plus there's an additional um, almost... Um, Oh, 80 some sites, so we have a total of 124 sites right now that are either hospital based, local health department based, or other entity based. So there's a lot of testing out there right now. We just right. need to get people to do it. And, and, and that goes directly to my next point, and, and you referred to it, the Fairbanks study that's doing almost 5,000 times five over the course of a year that includes the antibiotic mm -hmm. test. Yeah, the, the antibody test Which, too. So we'll have some results, I think, uh, midweek, maybe Wednesday. That's, that's what's on my calendar. Okay, then that's, then that's <laughs> I'm what told we'll know by Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you. Rachel? Stephanie Wade, WRTV. Hello, Stephanie. Good afternoon. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, crystal clear. All right. Well, happy Monday. It is. Uh, you too. Yeah. Obviously, some businesses were able to open today. Um, I had a question about how you were able to decide which businesses to open when for instance, we had a campground owner reach out to us asking why campgrounds were in phase three of reopening, along with gyms and movie theaters and not phase two with other businesses, you know, since they can spread out and can social distance. Um, states like Maryland and Virginia actually lifted their restrictions on campgrounds, realizing the same thing. So any reconsideration there, whether it's campgrounds or other kinds of businesses? You want to speak to that? I can too. <laughs> So we, we are looking at all of those things. I, I'll be honest with you, when we looked at the gyms, that is a place where we frequently see a lot of influenza and a lot of other de diseases that are easily spread because people are in very co close quarters working, uh, working out and sweating and, and breathing heavily. It's a hard thing to do with a mask on. The equipment is an easy way to, to spread that. So we were really trying to, again, do this gradually and open it up little by little. The thing with campgrounds are that when you first open something up and not everything else is open, everybody flocks to the campgrounds. I know just the, the park out at Fort Bend where I love to go, it, I love it. And I've never in my life seen it as busy as I saw it last weekend, which, which was great. I was glad that people were out. But again, when you talk about campgrounds where people are sleeping, then you've got you know the facilities where people use the restroom and they shower and everything else. And the importance of being able to make sure that we have everything in place at those facilities so that we can protect individuals. That being said, I'm a big supporter of getting outside and hiking and getting your exercise in. I think that's really important and that's an easy thing to do to stay six foot apart and to be able to um, wear, wear your mask if you are in, around people. Yeah, and I would just say, Stephanie, that's when, if you rewind the tape and go back a few days, uh, over a week, um, that's when I kind of talked about most of this is science, some of this is art because you're having to make decisions. Uh, about different waves coming back online or re-engaging. And so while we would love to say, you know, campgrounds, youth leagues, gyms, um, 
restaurants at a higher percentage, uh, churches, movie theaters, everyone um, can start to make accommodations, safety accommodations, but how we gradually um, bring folks back online. We have to spread this out to make sure that the virus isn't spreading and that we can continue to dial up or down as we go. And so they're, they're tough decisions for sure. Um, we're trying to get us all at the same place at the, um, in, in July, August, September going forward, uh, but we couldn't just all lurch and, and all spin up at the same time. Jody Kaufman, WRBI. Hello, Jody. Hello, Governor. Thank you for taking my question. Sure. Um, it's kind of, I think, possibly a follow-up from last week. It's my understanding from sources that the state-sponsored testing sites um, require the local county uh, health departments to provide funding for the site as well as um, cleaning tasks daily and beforehand. Uh, my question is, um, they're already overtaxed in funding from the pandemic themselves. Will any of that funding from the $300 million go directly to our local health departments to help them with their budgets? There certainly may be some monies that come to the local health departments in that respect. I, we really haven't uh, put much of a burden on them. We did ask if it would be possible to help with uh, the cleaning of the sites afterwards um, within their communities because they work within their communities and they know the individuals who could clean there and us from the State Department of Health trying to reach out and do that. I think that is something that we could, if that's a huge burden, certainly uh, work with um, the general and other places that are volunteering their um, areas uh, to see if we can help with arranging that cleaning. Chris, you want to speak in a broader sense to how funding is making it to locals and, and when? Sure. Um, Chris Johnston, uh, Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, we had spoken before regarding the uh, $300 million uh, that is directed to uh, local governments for uh, fighting the, the pandemic. And this would be an eligible cost uh, if it's not covered from other revenue streams. Uh, the reason I raise that is the last installment, what's called CARES 3.5, uh, included a provision uh, to uh, state health departments for um, testing and contact tracing. And so we'll be also looking at that and looking at the uh, availability of not only the state of Indiana's cost, but its use at the local level. Thank you, Chris. Sherry with the Indianapolis Star. Good afternoon, Sherry. Good afternoon. Um, I have two questions for you. One is looking at the numbers out of Marion and Lake Counties, obviously it's Monday, it's a long week. Do you have any sense, Dr. Box, of what you will recommend for them as they consider whether it's time to come out of the stay at home order that they've extended? And also if either of you has any thoughts, school is out, um, in two weeks for a lot of kids. This is a somewhat self-serving question on my part, but um, what about camps? I know a lot of people, a lot of people are saying they won't go to camp if it's offered. A lot of camps are saying they're not. Some camps are in limbo. I know the CDC has some guidance pending. Um, any thoughts, obviously, on what guidance you guys might be coming up with? Well, we're definitely looking at that because a lot of our uh, essential workers and individuals who need to go back to work, that was kind of their summer uh, daycare, right, was to have camps set up for their kids, especially to kind of day camps, which um, I really personally don't have an issue with. So we'll be looking at that, and, and there is some um, preliminary guidance out there that we're working with and should be um, able to speak to that very soon. Um, the other thing you talked about, Sherry, was, oh, Marion County and Lake County. I don't know today on Monday where the governor is going to be with this as we look at these numbers, but I do know we're going to be looking very specifically at all of our regions of the state, specifically at our highest risk, our hotspot areas in the state, and where they are right now with regards to all of those things that we look at. 
their testing capabilities, their number of hospital admissions, their um, number of ICU beds, their number of uh, ventilators that are available. Um, where the outbreaks are, again, I mentioned the other day, is really important, right? If one particular area has a huge outbreak because it's a, you know, a, a kid's camp or something, that, that's not good. But again, that's a younger, healthier population that tends to do better with this. And, and so that may not enter in as much as a long-term care facility that has multiple individuals that are very, very ill. So we, we really need to look at all of that at one time. And, and also we'll be talking with um, local health officers in that area too, in the, in the communities, to see what their thought process is. Just exactly what I was going to say. So <laughs> took the words out of my mouth. Dominic from WTHI. Good afternoon, Dominic. Good afternoon, uh, Governor Holcomb and Dr. Box. Uh, I have a question concerning the contact tracing. I know both of you spoke on the invasion of privacy um, or the uh, you know, guard against that uh, in your opening statement. Uh, State Representative Alan Morrison here in our area uh, says that this is indeed an invasion of privacy. He says the decision is an abuse of power and the state legislature should have been consulted. Um, now, these again, these are his words. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts on these concerns of privacy, um, maybe unilateral decision, and why wasn't the state legislature not involved in the process? And then back to the enforcement question, uh, will law enforcement be utilized to make sure citizens comply and give information or how will that be enforced? Thank you. Well, when we looked at this, um, Indiana State Department of Health has long held for over 30 years statutory authority to do investigations and contact tracing for many of the diseases that I've already mentioned, like, like measles and TB and HIV, and um, even foodborne illnesses that occur in a restaurant or, or because a group was gathered together at a big picnic. So that has been something that's been ongoing for like over a hundred years in our state and, and not really anything that unusual to be honest. The big difference here is that this is on a much wider scale uh, during the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so it's all across our state with many, many more people affected, um, but not any less critically important as we go forward. And this is our way again of being able to establish that new normal is to be able to individualize this and to look directly at the individuals that may be affected, may be infected, and need to isolate if they're infected or quarantine if they've been exposed. With regards to law enforcement, to my knowledge, this has not happened. And normally when there's a big issue, I know uh, from across the state because local health officers and communities reach out to me about this, I have not had a single person call me with an inability to contact trace or an inability to get someone to isolate at home or an inability to get someone to quarantine. Because as I've mentioned, people don't want to make other individuals sick. They do want to protect the people they work with, their family and their loved ones. Um, but also I don't think Hoosiers want to take a step backward and not be able to continue to move forward gradually into that new normal. Yeah, and we'll, we'll Obviously, um, we, we seek to protect people's health and, and their privacy along the way. We can also um, reach out to the federal task force who squarely places a heavy emphasis on not just testing but tracing uh, as in terms of how we find our way through this pandemic. Our final question is from Nikki Kelly, the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. Good afternoon, Nikki. Hi, Governor. Um, I was wondering, I had two quick questions. The first is the Trump administration has said we need to test a million nursing home residents and staff in the next two weeks. So I wanted to see if that was, frankly, a little too late, too little, too late. And then second of all, I've had questions from people who've been to the BMV and say that workers are not wearing masks. So I wanted to find out what the requirement is for state employees. Mm -hmm. I will say uh, with regards to um, the recommendation out of the White House, um, we knew that our, our long-term care facilities would be our highest risk individuals. We've messaged that from day one, from the get-go, and tried to protect them. We have used um, the limited testing that we have um, had across the state 
very, very um, judiciously um, in especially our long-term care facilities and been very, very careful to test even asymptomatic individuals there that we knew could be in close contact or exposed. And, and the same thing within our prison system. Um, to to put into perspective testing every long-term care resident and every employee would be, and in the state of Indiana, around 100,000 people within the next two weeks. So that is a, a lot to bite off at one time. I will say that realistically, we already have been messaging our, with our long-term care facilities that if you have cases, we want your employees to come and get tested. We want to know. And we have gone in and actually helped to test those individuals. And many people in the same ward on on the same floor, in the same area, uh, to try to help with this. And so we will, as a state, continue to follow the CMS guidelines and the guidelines that are put out by CMS and, and work to achieve that. Yeah, and I would just say, Nikki, to, on your follow-up question um, at the BMV, depends on that worker. We would want to know, obviously, if there's customer interaction, if someone is not wearing a mask, or if there's not a physical plexiglass uh, barrier between that person and the uh, and the customer coming in. We want to make sure it's a safe environment. If someone sees an employee who is not interfacing with the public, who may be working in their office by themselves, uh, they may not have a mask on. So we do um, need to know and want to know. But they're, they, the BMV, uh, as well as all of our state agencies that have a plan uh, to responsibly and safely reopen, have been working. Um, around the clock, I should say again, uh, to make sure that they're doing it in a safe way. Thank you for joining today's briefing. Governor Holcomb's next briefing will be Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern.